Perfect. All right. So we can go ahead and get started. All right, thank you very much. And everyone, thank you very much for being patient while we got that sorted. Um, my name is Kirsten Nauman. I am the program coordinator for TPOD, Trumbull's Prevention Partnership. TPOD is a community coalition and our mission is to prevent youth substance use and to promote mental wellness really across the whole lifespan. Our program tonight is the eighth installment of Let's Talk Mental Health Trumbull, which is a virtual speaker series highlighting and demystifying topics, information and resources around mental health. Each installment features experts from within the field of mental health to speak on a diverse variety of topics and offers authentic dialogue and practical suggestions and support. You can view previous episodes of Let's Talk Mental Health on our website at www.tpod.org. And I am now going to turn it over to our first select woman, Vicki Chisoro, um, to welcome you all here and to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten, and hello to everyone and welcome to tonight's Let's Talk Mental Health Trumbull. Through this series, we hope to offer support and resources to families as they navigate the path to mental wellness. Let's Talk Mental Health is a collaboration between many community partners, and I'd like to thank them now. The Trumbull Health Department, Trumbull EMS, the Mary J. Sherlock Counseling Center, Trumbull Community Television, PTA Council, the Lakewood Trumbull YMCA, and my friend, Abby. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome Mary Dobson, psychotherapist, certified eating disorder specialist, certified school-based therapist, certified shame-informed treatment specialist, and founder and CEO of Lift Wellness in Westport. Ms. Dobson has a Master of Arts in Marital and Family Therapy and pursued her postgraduate studies at Fairfield University. Her career spans two decades on the front lines of eating disorder prevention, identification, treatment, and advocacy work. Ms. Dobson is one of select practitioners nationwide to hold certified eating disorder specialist credentialing through the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. In 2016, Mary Dobson launched, launched Lift Wellness, a behavioral health specialty group and boutique eating disorder treatment center. This year, she opened Lift Teen and Parent Wellness Centers, a licensed outpatient psychiatric clinic, intensive outpatient program, and day program for mood, anxiety, and eating disorders. An adult counterpart to the pediatric program will launch this spring. Ms. Dobson is dedicated to developing healing spaces deliverable to children, teens, adults, and families. We are delighted to have her joining us this evening. Mary, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much for that beautiful welcome and uh, and thank you for having me and for creating space for um, this topic, which is very near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, Eating Disorder Awareness Week is actually uh, coming up. And so it's very fitting to kind of do this, uh, you know, at this time. I have a, a tremendous amount of information that I'd like to share with you tonight, and uh, but I would also like to make this as interactive as possible. Um, my favorite thing is when I can give a presentation and have folks uh, ask questions and interrupt me um, right, you know, as I'm going through, because I think sometimes if we wait towards the end, uh, you know, you may lose uh, the thought that you had or whatever triggered it. So I, I just, uh, I can't see your faces, which is interesting um, for, for me, but uh, but if you have a question, please type it into the chat. And I think the chat is activated and um, please feel free to interrupt me and I'll try to get into it in real time just to make this a more um, conversational uh, presentation. So, um, so I'm gonna begin. And uh, so I designed this presentation to really help, uh, let's see, okay. Um, I designed this presentation to really help uh, parents to have more information uh, to be able to better help their kids um, in the way of eating disorder prevention, as well as fostering a healthy relationship with food and body 
Because the reality is, while a subsection of American children and teens will develop eating disorders, uh, what we're what we're learning is that there are so many subclinical eating disorders, and uh, there's so much disordered eating behavior that is very rampant. And uh, aside from sort of the clinically, uh, the diagnostic criteria for eating disorders, there are many people who suffer that are not identified um, because of uh, either uh, inability to come forward and, and talk about it, or maybe family, uh, teachers, coaches, pediatricians not identifying the signs. Um, so we do talk a lot at Lyft about prevention. Prevention is the best uh, chance we have to combat eating disorders. Um, and uh, we at Lyft take a very family focused approach um, and we call ourselves a family embracing program because our goal is to empower parents um, first with education and then you know, through the treatment process. Um, so, uh, we, I'm very privileged to work with, uh, some pretty incredible folks. Um, I always love to talk about them. I have, um, Dr. Alyssa Bennett, uh, of, of Connecticut Children's is our, our medical director, um, in our, uh, outpatient and IOP PHP services. She's an incredible, um, adolescent medicine specialist. And, um, several of these, uh, ladies are folks who I've worked with for, uh, a couple of decades now, um, and uh, they've been very instrumental in um, uh, shaping the our practice and and you know making our practice what it is today. Um, so I'm going to go right into it. Okay, so I I will um, begin by doing a run through of eating disorders. Some of them are familiar, some of them may be less familiar. Um, I like to make several points here. Uh, anorexia um, is an eating disorder that is, uh, is recognizable and, and well known, but um, something that folks often don't know about anorexia is that uh, it is in fact a biologically based uh, disorder, not a, a vanity disorder or a disorder spurred through um, social media. And uh, and so this biologically based disorder has been around for a very long time um, and has its roots in um, actually uh, the very beginning of, of uh, uh, recorded mental health history. So um, in 1689, uh, anorexia was actually identified, uh, and it was called by Dr. Richard Morton um, a nervous consumption. So he understood, even at that time in 1689, that anorexia was really a um, uh, an anxiety disorder. And uh, there have been many phases and stages of treatment, in particular for anorexia, which is the oldest eating disorder. Um, there have have been uh, there was a stage when children were separated from their parents in what was called a parentectomy. And a parentectomy was essentially uh, insinuating that the parents were the problem, right? And they were separating the kids um, from their parents. Uh, ironically, you know, the residential level of care for eating disorders is not so dissimilar from that, that mindset. Uh, so at Lyft, we take a very different approach. Our goal is to sort of keep people out of residential facilities by engaging families, helping families to become more involved. Um, lots of uh, sort of mischaracterizations and misunderstandings throughout the years about anorexia. Um, it was uh, thought to have sexual origins at one time. Um, the DSM only included it in 1980. Uh, and, you know, of course, we, we often when we talk about eating disorders, we talk about Karen Carpenter, who um, did die of anorexia refeeding syndrome, um, which is something that I'll get into in a few slides, uh, but essentially the, the very dangerous work of, of putting food back into somebody who has been malnourished for a period of time. Um, so we now understand that uh, eating disorders are biopsychosocial. And so, you know, the, the, the history of uh, anorexia, you look back on and, and sort of, um, it, it's more of just something of interest. Uh, so uh, bulimia, 
many uh, are familiar with what bulimia is. It is self-induced vomiting, but it also can show up in the form of um, over-exercise. So someone who's exercising in a compensatory way, um, meaning trying to eliminate the calories that they took in um, or exercising as a reaction to something that they ate, uh, that is indeed also bulimia. Um, fasting, chewing, and spitting are bulimia, and uh, laxative and diuretic abuse um, is also characterized as bulimia. Uh, binge eating is an eating disorder that we're learning more and more about, and uh, it was the only the, the most recent to be added into um, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders. Um, binge eating is uh, is its own eating disorder, and it is now as such uh, reimbursable by insurance. So treatment is now covered by insurance. When I was coming up in the field, it wasn't. Um, typically binge, is, uh, binge eating is eating a large amount of calories, uh, usually 700 calories or more in one sitting, feelings of sickness, fullness, um, and uh, often followed by uh, remorse and self-loathing. Um, something that I think is really important to highlight that applies to uh, children, adolescents, and adults is that, you know, America has a very uh, conflicted and violent relationship with food and eating and body and diet. Uh, and something of note is that the research really supports this idea that deprivation is at the heart of uh, most eating disorders, including binge eating. So, you know, we often see people who are uh, identified uh, as having binge eating disorder, but typically at the root or the beginning of their story, there was a period of restriction. Um, so it's really important when we think about, you know, our teens, you know, they'll often talk about, uh, well, I have a dance coming up, so I'm going to diet. And, uh, or I'm going to skip lunch today because no one eats lunch in the calf. Um, and they feel this sort of sense of uh, pride that they were able to skip a meal or a couple of meals and demonstrate this willpower. Uh, but this, ironically, this deprivation feeling is a huge trigger for binging. Um, and we see that a lot in kids who go to school often they won't eat all day and then they come home and they'll have a big binge because they're so hungry that they've lost their um, intuitive eating abilities. So, you know, when we talk about uh, sort of the etiology of bulimia and binge eating disorder, we can't do so without looking at deprivation as a causal factor um, and starting that yo-yoing loop. Okay. Um, so believe it or not, there are certain personality characteristics that are closely aligned with different eating disorders. And we've actually been able to pull out some of the personality characteristics that are um, that predispose someone and make someone vulnerable to developing a particular set of eating disorder symptoms. Um, for example, uh, people who struggle with feelings of unworthiness, perfectionism, and difficulty saying no are more likely to develop anorexia. Um, people who struggle with guilt and shame and impulsivity are more likely to develop bulimia. Um, and folks who struggle with confrontation and uh, have very black and white thinking um, and, and a sense of insatiability uh, they often struggle with binge eating disorder. Um, so there's a personality alignment with different eating disorders. Um, you may not be familiar with orthorexia. Orthorexia is considered subclinical, uh, but it is the obsession with food quality and not quantity. Um, we see a lot of this with uh, sort of the whole foods mindset, you know, um, I'm a vegan or I'm vegetarian or I'm um, I don't eat processed foods. Uh, I don't eat, uh, I only eat clean. You know, people will make a lot of comments about uh, the quality of the food that they eat. And there can be almost a virtue signaling about that. Um, 
And so what what's of note is that orthorexia for tweens and teens is kind of the gateway drug to anorexia. So when we see, you know, young people, tweens, teens uh, talking about uh, cleaning up their diets and, uh, you know, eliminating uh, processed foods and fixating on healthy versus unhealthy uh, for a rigid or obsessive personality or an anxious temperament or a perfectionistic temperament that can very easily and quickly snowball and spiral into um, full-blown anorexia. Uh, we also see uh, at Lyft a lot of ARFID. ARFID is um, gaining notoriety. Years ago, it wasn't something that I heard talked about so often. Um, we typically see ARFID in children, although we also see it in adults. Um, and ARFID is, you know, uh, to, to put it uh, sort of casually, um, those folks that will only eat white foods, right? So you've got these kids and you ask them what they ate today. Well, I had, I, I, I had toast, I had chicken nuggets, I had pancakes. Um, I had potato chips, I had mashed potatoes, right? They, they don't eat, um, you know, the full range of vegetables. They don't particularly like protein. Uh, there is this uh, extreme picky eating that is, tends to be largely oriented around carbohydrates and white foods. Um, so ARFID doesn't uh, correspond with a fear of weight gain or distress over body shape and weight, but people who have ARFID are very likely to become malnourished because they're really not getting uh, a full range of um, vitamins and minerals. And uh, ARFID is very comorbid with anxiety and autism. Um, as I mentioned, we do see a lot of ARFID in young children. And, uh, and so a lot of parents will come to us with um, young kids who are dealing with ARFID. Uh, OSFID is a, um, a blanket category that kind of just talks about atypical anorexia. Atypical anorexia means you can have anorexia and you don't have to be underweight. Uh, we see people who have uh, profound, severe anorexia who are normal body weight or even overweight, but they are experiencing malnourishment because they are restricting their caloric intake to such an extent. So restricting caloric intake um, doesn't necessarily always equate to unhealthy weight loss. Sometimes people actually present at an average weight, but are pretty profoundly impacted by um, eating disorder behaviors, restriction, purging over exercising. Um, so these are all different uh, categories of eating disorders that we're, we're learning to identify with greater vigilance. Um, so... And then, of course, disordered eating. So uh, it, when we think about what affects the grand majority of uh, tweens and teens and adults, uh, disordered eating is pretty prevalent in this country. Uh, a combination of dieting, clean eating, exclusion eating, uh, binging, skipping meals. Uh, disordered eating is something that, you know, if you turn on the news in January, you hear the news casters talking about, you know, going on new, uh, new year, new you, going on a diet, uh, keto, this, that, the other thing, um, very uh, on trend, very culturally acceptable. Uh, and uh, it's something that, again, is a gateway to other eating disorders. So disordered eating is not intuitive eating. It's um, playing games with uh, caloric intake and um, attempting to control body size or shape through manipulating uh, what someone's eating and what they're taking in and how they're taking it in. Um, so disordered eating similarly to eating disorders may be genetically or biologically predisposed, but people um, with disordered eating are more likely to develop eating disorders. Um, we also have a lot of data that suggests that parents with disordered eating are more likely to produce children with disordered eating. And some of that is probably heritable and some of it is also um, mirroring and mimicking. And, uh, and so we do really, um, we do pay attention to this because uh, disordered eating can cause a fair amount of negative body image and body dissatisfaction 
And uh, our kids are so inundated now through social media and through the comparison traps, which we'll get into, that um, it creates a real vulnerability uh, when they're also trying to manipulate their body say, size or shape um, through what they're taking in. Um, so, you know, we can uh, kind of agree that there's a tremendous issue uh, here in the U.S., probably uh, fueled again by some of the um, the, the impact of social media, which uh, in 2012 kind of came in on the scene and teen mental health had a tremendous uh, negative impact. Um, so, you know, some of these numbers are right around that time or shortly thereafter. And I would argue that um, it's only gotten worse, you know, in, in the advent since then. Um, so the excessive focus on looks and physical appearance uh, again, something that we really watch for when we talk about prevention, because uh, the more someone is focused on their physical appearance, their presentation, and the more they believe that, the, that their society, the society or the community that they live in is focused on looks and presentation, um, the more their mental health, their emotional stability uh, can suffer and um, increase their likelihood of developing an eating disorder. Um, we see a lot of uh, kids suffering from negative body image. Uh, negative body image can relate to many different things. And body dysmorphia uh, is something that is, is a clinical diagnosis. Um, but essentially, body dysmorphia is a hyper focus on uh, these aspects of negative body image uh, to such an extent that that focus begins to become out of proportion. And body dysmorphic disorder is really interesting because it is in fact a perceptual disturbance. Uh, when we've done studies where kids are shown an image of uh, someone or they're shown a, a series of images and when they're asked to identify a body that looks like theirs, uh, if they suffer from body dysmorphic disorder, they'll, they'll actually choose a body that's about 10% larger than theirs as the one that looks like themselves. And then when asked to identify a body that, um, that resembles uh, a, a stranger's body, they will uh, pick a body that's 10% uh, smaller than the body that they were asked to, to compare to. So there's a distortion, there's an actual um, measurable difference in uh, they're seeing them, themselves as larger than they are and others as smaller than they are. Um, and you may have experienced that with teens where, you know, you, you see some of that, uh, you know, that disruption. Um, so body dysmorphic disorder is, uh, as you can see, the most vulnerability is really between 11 and 20. Uh, the vulnerability uh, for body dysmorphic disorder does go down as children age out. Okay. Okay, so something that really surprises people is that uh, eating disorders are biologically based, um, psychologically based, and also social. Um, but it's only the perfect storm that will then create uh, a full-blown eating disorder. So um, in order to develop an eating disorder, there does need to be uh, a, a family history of some kind of mental health condition, and uh, as well as certain co-occurring psychological factors, uh, generally inflexibility, um, perfectionism, and then of course, social factors, which we all live with. Um, living in, in this area in Fairfield County, I think that um, we can all agree that there is a very real weight stigma. There's a tremendous uh, impact uh, put on having an athletic body or having a fit body. Um, and uh, we certainly do have cultural norms that uh, overvalue appearance, not just appearance in the way of uh, you know, physical presentation, but also appearance of, uh, as we get older, our home or our car or, you know, what uh, college stickers are on the back of our car. So we, you know, we definitely have a society that is uh, 
that is focused on these areas and kids pick up on that. Um, so, you know, in general, there are certain warning signs that we look for, you know, when we're diagnosing or assessing eating disorders, uh, rituals, body checking, um, weakness and mood changes, and um, thoughts and behaviors regarding food that become predominant. Uh, family risk factors include uh, weight stigma, um, trauma, isolation, um, and then protective factors, uh, regular family meals, right? Just like with substance use, there's a huge correlation between family meals and lowered rates of substance use, lowered rates of eating disorders. Family meals are very protective. Um, eating together, having that time, it's very difficult in our modern day and age because we often are running kids to sports and activities, but carving out time for those family meals, whether it be uh, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, it doesn't have to be that it's dinner, it could be a wonderful breakfast before school. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to be that it's that dinner is the only option if a dad isn't home or a mom isn't home for dinner. Um, lots of kids tell us that their parents are, you know, joining a gym, trying to lose weight, talking about wanting to lose weight. Um, that's, uh, that's something that we, we tell parents, you know, it's very easy to control that protective factor, right? If you don't talk about those things in front of your kids, you're giving them a protective factor. Okay. Okay, so um, in terms of the, the way that we think about eating disorders, eating disorders are really, they're a mental health diagnosis that become a physical problem. And in the treatment of eating disorders, we're treating the uh, mental health diagnosis, we're treating the physical problem, but we're also treating the temperament because there's a reason why people develop their eating disorders. Their eating disorders are doing something for them. And typically what they're doing is they're providing some kind of relief or solution or soothing to a psychological disturbance. That could be anxiety, it could be rumination, it could be uh, low self-esteem. Um, and so we have to look at what is it about this person that is, has created a need for them to have such a maladaptive coping skill. Um, when we think about temperamental factors, uh, we say we treat to the trait. So uh, for example, people with eating disorders often have uh, perfectionism that falls far outside of the bell curve. And so they're never going to be people who don't have perfectionism because perfectionism is, is typically a quality that, you know, if you have, it, it's going to stick with you. Um, but we have to take that perfectionism and bring it back into the bell curve. So what we're working on is um, we're working on kind of harnessing these out of balance traits like perfectionism, which is, you know, if you have too much of it can be too much of a good thing and then bringing it back into alignment, bringing it into an adaptive range. So it doesn't burn the person out or create so much mental stress that they need to rely on these secondary coping strategies like eating disorder or substance use. Um, so we're looking at, uh, you know, how to sort of bring these traits back into balance. Okay, so uh, we, we, we certainly can't uh, avoid talking about the influence of social media, uh, delay, delay, delay. Um, but of course, uh, social media is a real part of our lives. Um, children are spending an inordinate amount of time on it. There's a tremendous amount of visual cueing that happens when kids are repetitiously looking at images of bodies, particularly bodies that resemble a particular uh, frame and a particular size and shape. Uh, and if that size and shape doesn't resemble their own, that can set up some pretty significant uh, incongruence for those kids. Um, there's a, a, t a lot of research now that, you know, the kids that are using social media more often are more depressed, more anxious, and have worse body image. Um, 
you know, there's also these filter apps now, which can manipulate the way that people look. And so not only are we uh, 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 engaging with images of, of people that have been doctored, um, often the kids are doctoring their own images or applying filters to themselves. And then once they've done so, they're comparing the way that they actually look to the way they look in this virtual reality. Um, and so we have to be really careful about that. Often kids will come in and they'll say, well, I always apply this particular filter and now I want to get a nose job or, um, you know, uh, Botox or lip filler to more closely resemble the filtered image of myself that I've created here. So it gives them a, a chance to sort of imagine, well, what would I look like if my appearance was changed in that way? And then they feel that they should go ahead and make those changes because this is, um, you know, an opportunity to see uh, a, a more idealized version of themselves. Um, so risk factors uh, for athletes, athletes are at the highest rate of uh, developing eating disorders. Um, elite athletes are at the very highest rate of developing eating disorders, likely because uh, to be an elite athlete, you already have to be someone with a tremendous amount of um, endurance and willpower and uh, rigidity and perfectionism. And so those happen to be qualities that are very correlated with developing eating disorders and can make someone very successful at having one. Um, we see a lot of uh, figure skaters, um, wrestlers, uh, certainly dancers, um, but increasing and uh, rowers. But we, we increasingly we see folks from all different sports who are um, either pressurized by their coaches, uh, their parents, their peers to change their bodies rapidly um, and in a way that isn't healthful. And that can become uh, a, a very habituated pattern for people. So um, for, for people like me, it's always important to kind of try to get out in front of coaches and talk to them about the, the impact they could have, which could be very positive or very negative, um, depending on where their level of consciousness is. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get into uh, just very quickly, uh, you know, refeeding, which um, which is uh, when we're dealing with uh, someone who who has anorexia and they're eating far less than 1400 calories a day. Um, it is really important that they are refed uh, by a specialist team because of refeeding syndrome, which which is a. Um, a syndrome that uh, I didn't know about until I went into the eating disorder field. Uh, and, and it's really something that most folks uh, are, are not familiar about or not educated about, uh, but it is a physical reaction to having been malnourished for a period of time. And so if an adolescent or even an adult is malnourished for a period of time and calories are reintroduced too quickly, uh, the body can have a physiological response, which um, somewhat resembles a seizure, uh, but is actually uh, really a, um, a cardiac event. And one of the, the main precursors of this is um, a disruption in potassium. Uh, so when we have you know, folks who have anorexia that we're working with, um, we do get their labs and we look at their potassium and we are refeeding them slowly and in small increments to make sure that they're refeeding safely. Um, so I think you know most of us are familiar with uh, some of the general medical co uh, complications and markers of instability uh, in eating disorders. I do uh, like to mention that males uh, have virtually the same presentation numbers of eating disorders as females, but just are far less likely to present to treatment because of stigma. So um, you know, with with men. Uh, their body image ideals may be very different than women. Um, sometimes men are looking for a highly muscular look on top and a very lean torso and very lean and athletic legs. Um, but sometimes men are looking for uh, sort of a, um, a, a very low BMI presentation and uh, which is, which is all, all the more difficult for them to achieve. And, uh, and so you also see uh, 
men who are aspiring to, you know, the skinny jeans and, you know, the tight fitting clothing and going for that look, um, which, you know, is, is, is difficult for them to come by. Um, so uh, the, uh, let's see, I'm going to skip ahead here. Um, I, I always, I feel like I can never give a talk about eating disorders without mentioning uh, the Minnesota starvation experiment. Um, this was a, uh, an incredible uh, fast forward in the field of eating disorders. Once this study was conducted, it really changed the way we thought about eating disorders. Um, what we learned uh, through the Minnesota starvation experiment, which is also called the Keys study, uh, was uh, we, we essentially measured a, a test group of uh, otherwise healthy individuals. Um, they were put on a, uh, a, a calorically restricted diet for about six months. They lost a tremendous amount of weight. Uh, they experienced all the traditional uh, expected side effects of losing weight too rapidly. Um, which includes uh, the catabolism of organs, bones, and tissues, um, cognitive atrophy, right? So less, uh, less uh, sharpness, um, loss of strength, energy coordination, decreased basal metabolic rate, um, heart rate slowed, dizziness, all things that we would expect. What we weren't expecting, right, was uh, that uh, these gentlemen that were studied developed body dysmorphia, uh, episodes of hysteria, depression, and anxiety, um, and an increased food and body preoccupation and rumination. Um, so they developed symptoms of anorexia from the experience of being on a restrictive diet. And what that taught us is sort of a what came first, uh, chicken or the egg uh, scenario, which is that essentially someone could accidentally fall into anorexia um, through a prolonged period of uh, unintentional uh, restriction. And we see that in um, children often and teens, we often see kids who um, throw up and then they become afraid of throwing up. And uh, so they're afraid of eating because they don't want to vomit again. Or we see teens who have mono and they lose weight uh, and they, they lost weight unintentionally, but then they're afraid to gain it back. And so eating disorders can, um, can actually happen uh, unintentionally. And, uh, and so they're, they're, I always say that eating disorders are usually come by innocently. It's not like people sign up and say, I'd, I'd like to get one of those, you know, put my name on the list. Um, so, uh, so we look at for, um, uh, Karen looking forward, we, again, early detection, early intervention. Um, I, I should go through the, the levels of care. Uh, what, uh, lift is, is, um, uh, we provide outpatient, intensive outpatient and partial hospitalization programs. So that's all day, day treatment. Um, those are all programs that people come to, they receive resources for, a short period of time or a longer period of time, and then they go home. Um, a step up from that is residential treatment. Uh, when the lower levels of care fail um, for any form of mental health, including eating disorders, um, the, uh, the next step is residential services, which can last between um, three weeks to three months, uh, and uh, then followed with a discharge to a lower level of care, like a partial or an IOP. Um, and the highest level of care is intent is inpatient hospitalization. Um, so these are the different levels of care for uh, for eating disorders. Okay. Um, one thing I'll say about uh, working with a treatment team when uh, starting the recovery process from an eating disorder, uh, we always have a, a primary care provider involved, uh, an adolescent medicine specialist, uh, a nutritionist, um, a therapist, and uh, the client and the family. We will also involve a psychiatry provider, but something that's really important to know is that SSRIs and psychiatric medication will not work if someone is clinically underweight or purging. So, um, 
there needs to be a sufficient amount of body fat in order to absorb and metabolize SSRIs and psychiatric medication. Uh, if you see someone who's underweight and they're suffering from depression until they are within 5% of their ideal body weight, that medication is not going to help them. Um, so refeeding is a part of that process that has to happen um, in order for that, that medication to work. Okay. Um, when it comes to pediatrics, we intervene fairly early with eating disorders of, of all kinds. Um, reason being, when you see an adult uh, and they have an eating disorder, they're done growing, um, their bones, their brains, often they've already had their children. And so you have a window of time to treat them. Uh, when you have a pediatric case, uh, you know, the clock is really ticking on uh, intervening on the eating disorder because uh, pediatric cases, first of all, kids need a lot of food to grow. And so they can lose weight very quickly and easily when they do start to restrict. Um, by losing weight, you know, they can, uh, girls can lose their menses, which uh, when the menses is missing for consecutive months can cause bone damage that can really last. Uh, also, they can develop uh, cognitive atrophy, brain damage, which uh, while reversible, uh, does impact their cognition, their insight, and their ability to process logic and reason. So the longer they're sort of in a malnourished state, the less reachable they are through mechanisms like cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so we, we intervene very quickly. The other thing that we see very commonly is something called growth retardation due to malnutrition, which is um, when a child stops eating or starts restricting their calories, they can actually uh, stunt their growth. So if they're on the growth curve and the growth curve is looking like this and they start to restrict their caloric intake, um, you sometimes will see the growth curve kind of go like this and uh, they have fallen off of the growth curve. They're no longer growing. Um, once they start eating enough calories again, they will start to grow again. But for women, for young women, if they're coming to us at age 13 or 14 and they've already gotten their periods, there's just a little bit of time to make that growth up before the growth plates lock. Um, so, so there's a timeliness to um, treating the disorder. Um, just a, a, a minute on uh, cognitive atrophy. The reason why you know kids really need wonderful nutrition when they're growing and developing, um, the, the dendritic pruning that's happening during this phase of life is very critical for the rest of their lives. Um, so when this doesn't happen during this phase of life, um, there can be a bit of a stunting that, that takes place where you know sometimes we'll see very chronic patients who have had an eating disorder for um, since childhood, and uh, there's an observation when speaking with them. It's it's almost like speaking to a much younger person. It's uh, there's a um, a rigidity and a lack of logic that should have developed, and uh, their um, ability to reason and to think critically is not as sophisticated as that of their peers. So the the process of um, of getting appropriate nutrition, you know, during adolescence is really um, so critical. Okay. Um, I think I mentioned that uh, heart rate is an important thing to look at when someone is restricting their caloric intake or purging, over-exercising, uh, the heart rate will start to slow down. The body starts to adjust and recalibrate in order to conserve energy. So hands will get cold because warm hands, not essential for survival. Um, everything about uh, bodily processes will be adjusted and slowed down in order to adapt to the amount of calories that are being consumed. Uh, for uh, the heart, that means that the heart will start to beat slower and slower. So often our patients who are restricting their caloric intake um, have a heart rate that while it should be in the uh, high 60s is in the low 40s. So their heart is just beating slower and slower and slower in order to adapt to not having enough energy. And uh, that is in entirely reversible as soon as they uh, return 
to having a proper diet. Um, usually it takes several weeks time and, uh, and they're back on track. So I, I, I do want to just say, I, I have to caution parents, pediatricians, we have to be so careful when kids are growing, um, not to make comments about their bodies. Uh, when kids go to the pediatrician's office, uh, I recommend blind weights. Um, I think that it's fine for a pediatrician to take the weight every time a child comes in, but uh, the child doesn't need to face the scale. The child can back up onto the scale. The pediatrician should quietly write the number down and really shouldn't say anything about the number. Um, you know, when I hear that pediatricians are taking out the, the BMI chart and showing that to kids, uh, that story is typically associated with dot, 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 and that's when my eating disorder started. Um, so it's very important that pediatricians uh, don't make an issue uh, about BMI and the way that different bodies develop. Some kids grow and then they gain, others gain and then they grow. Uh, but saying something that body shames someone is uh, not going to help them to develop a better relationship with food or body image. Um, so it's, it's, it's just uh, not the right approach. Um, okay. Um, we, we, we always talk about uh, suicide screening. Um, some say anorexia is slow death or slow suicide. Um, we always talk about suicide as screening when, when screening when we talk about mental health uh, topics because it's important for parents to sort of know um, how to be mindful and vigilant uh, about suicidal ideation in kids. And um, you know, you you know your child, you know your child's typical behavior, um, you know your child's risk factors and their protective factors. Um, so when you're looking at any kind of uh, situation with depression or use of uh, secondary coping skills like uh, maladaptive coping skills like eating disorder or substance use, you know, you're looking for root cause, what's underneath. Um, and when you're talking to children about uh, their feelings regarding, um, you know, doing a, a risk assessment, it's all about uh, finding whether they have ideation, uh, whether they're exhibiting behavior and whether they have a plan. Um, so those are the, the kinds of questions that um, you know, parents may want to, uh, to look at when they're um, talking to a child who's reportedly suffering from depression or anxiety um, or body uh, dysmorphia, body loathing. Okay. All right, I see there's a question, let's see. Okay, um, so there's a question, intermittent fasting is a popular, almost faddish weight loss method today. Have you seen any evidence of teens beginning this and then morphing into disordered eating? Uh, we have. Intermittent fasting is a, is a really tough one because it's something that many teens have learned about through their parents. Um, so it's a... Uh, for those who don't know, intermittent fasting is essentially uh, eating the bulk of one's calories during a time-restricted period in the day. So say during a five-hour window um, or another designated window of time, and then uh, not eating for the rest of the day, and then not eating through the, through the night and not eating in the morning. Um, so uh, it, it is very much a fad. And like all of these fads, um, you know, it it was uh, sort of publicized as a magic bullet. Um, we do see a lot of adolescents attempting to use it, which, of course, they shouldn't be because they really do need uh, nourishing meals at regular intervals in order to maintain their energy and their growth and their activity levels, because these adolescents are walking around school all day, they're playing sports, you know, they're often much more active than uh, adults who may sit in a chair all day and they're growing. Um, so while an adult perhaps could get away with 
um, doing a period of intermittent fasting and maybe the adult is consuming, you know, 1300 calories in this five hour window and that works for them, um, for an adolescent, that could lead to pretty rapid weight loss. And it could also lead to their metabolism really slowing down, which then prohibits them from being able to eat the amount of calories that they should be taking in. And, uh, you know, adolescents generally should be eating around 2000, 2500, um, sometimes up to 3000 calories a day, depending on their activity level and their growth. Um, so you can see why uh, it becomes really problematic when they try to engage in these behaviors. The other thing that we see with adolescents is, you know, they, they might do intermittent fasting and then uh, they activate that deprivation cycle and that restriction, which then causes them to have an episode of binging. Um, and that binging, again, leads to self-loathing, um, uh, feelings of shame, and sometimes to saying, you know, I got to go run this binge off or I have to purge this binge because this was, you know, out of control. This was unacceptable. So we really kind of want to start all this disorder, stop all this disordered eating at the root and uh, with the restriction um, so that we can avoid having all of these other issues. Um, so I, I like to talk about uh, health at every size. I think health at every size is really a very important and empowering thing to talk about. Uh, Health at Every Size is uh, was a originally a book written by Lindo Bacon in 2008, and but has become a movement. And uh, Health at Every Size uh, essentially says that, uh, and there's tons of data behind this, um, that one can be in a, a body that is a little bit overweight and be healthy and strong and fit and live a long, wonderful, full life. And, uh, you know, there were years in medicine when people who were overweight would go to the doctor and no matter what they complained about, the doctor would bring it back to their weight and say, well, you should lose weight. And uh, people began to feel very gaslit by their physicians, um, especially when their complaint had nothing to do with a weight related topic. Uh, I always say, you know, um, I have friends in all shapes and size bodies. Um, many of my friends uh, who are in larger bodies can run faster and longer than I can and are in much better shape and have a much better uh, overall diet than I do. Um, but their bodies are built differently. And so it's really important to kind of not shame people and make assumptions like someone is out of shape or they're not strong or they're not healthy because their body looks differently than what is sort of uh, put out there as the ideal body size and shape. Um, you know, there's also a lot of people that we see that are maybe the ideal body size and shape, but are incredibly unhealthy. And I think about some of the celebrities who are, uh, you know, who starve themselves and smoke cigarettes and use uh, stimulants to suppress their appetite and are taking Gozempic and uh, getting weight loss surgeries or getting plastic surgeries and uh, you know having uh, ribs removed to look like their stomachs are, are thinner, all these silly things. Um, that image when shown to an adolescent, the adolescent might say that that person is healthier than somebody who is on a, on a BMI chart, 10 to 15 pounds overweight, but runs every day, eats beautifully, drinks water. Um, so, you know, that is just uh, illogical. And we really have to look at the insides are not the outsides, the outsides are not the insides. Um, and we can't uh, place judgments on people based on their physical size and shape because they're really all are all different body types. And, uh, you know, and so it's important to, um, to really promote health at every size and, uh, health at every size is a protective factor against eating disorders, because if we can, as a society embrace all different sizes and shapes of bodies, then people won't feel as compelled to constantly change their bodies. 
And so um, promoting a health at every size school and community and highlighting, elevating people that may be in larger bodies, but, you know, are doing incredible things athletically, academically, um, and allowing there to be space for that and uh, be conscious of it. It's, it really does help. Um, I've heard people say that, you know, when they were young, they would watch, they would watch TV and there wouldn't be any fat characters on the TV or the fat character was always a bad guy. Um, you know, so these are the ways in which people really start to feel a lot of internalized stigma with where their bodies are in the moment. Um, and, you know, as we know, kids' bodies change. Um, sometimes kids, uh, girls in particular, girls have to gain 15 pounds to get their menses. So during that period of time, most of them have a belly and they feel self-conscious about it. Um, that belly uh, for, for many of them is, is just going to, you know, kind of uh, as they, they morph and change, um, you know, it is not going to look the way, they, the way it may look when they're a tween, but um, kids freeze themselves at this age. And so often we have a person who's 30 years old and they still think of themselves as that awkward 11 year old who had braces and the belly and, you know, um, and, and that's something that, uh, you know, is really a, a, a internalized shame and stigma uh, in uh, an adolescent. So, um, so again, I think uh, less, less uh, body-focused comments, less body-focused compliments, um, and uh, looking at whole health and activity rather than size and shape. Um, another thing that's really important to talk about is all foods fit. Uh, we take an all foods fit approach to nutrition which is variety and moderation. You know, we avoid language like clean food, dirty food, good food, bad food, processed food, healthy food, junk food. And we just talk about food is food. All food has some nutritional value. Um, I like to uh, put uh, a variety of things in the cabinets, on the counter, um, let there be access to all different kinds of foods. When food is not forbidden, uh, then it loses a lot of interest. Um, when food is forbidden at, at home, kids will often go to a friend's house and that's when they'll binge on, on the food. So it's good to have sort of access. Um, we want every kid to have intuitive eating, which is something you see very naturally in some cultures, not so much in, here in, in the States. Uh, intuitive eating is I'm hungry, I'm gonna feed myself, I'm full, I'm done. Uh, you know, if you think about hunger, the hunger and satiety scale being between a one and a 10, intuitive eating is staying between a two and an eight. It's not letting yourself get starving and it's not letting yourself get stuffed. Um, so intuitive eating is a non-diet approach. As long as we do intuitive eating, we're going to be healthful. The problem with uh, Americans is that we venture a field and we start dieting and restricting, which then promotes either more restriction or compensatory binging um, or yo-yo diets um, and cravings and, uh, and obsessions and this cycle. So um, it's really important to kind of, in order to have like a healthy body image and, uh, and peace with food, to practice intuitive eating um, and to teach our kids how to be intuitive eaters, which I would argue all kids are natural intuitive eaters. It's sort of society that undoes that instinct by telling them they need to micromanage their food. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of uh, benefits of intuitive eating, of course. Okay. So let me ask at this point, if we have any, um, any additional questions, because I can always keep going, but I'd love to just hear if there's um, anybody that hasn't asked a question that would like to, I want to make sure we have time. I don't see any right now, Mary, but we've okay. got about um, about maybe five or 10 minutes. Okay, um, great. And then we can yeah. see if there's any questions at the end. Okay, 
Um, so I'm going to get into some of the different treatment methods that we use when we're treating um, eating disorders, when we're treating mental health generally. Uh, one of the uh, interventions that you may be less familiar with is something that is really interesting. It's called exposure and response prevention, ERP. And ERP is essentially making a list of fears from a scale, say one to 10, and slowly approaching those fears from the least scary to the most scary. So if we have someone who's school avoidant, uh, we may recommend that at first, the family go to the school and sit in the parking lot in the car and listen to the kids' favorite songs during a time when the kid is not stressed, not anxious, just to sort of calm them, create a positive memory, positive imprint uh, that soothes their nervous system the next time they're at school. Um, the next day, you know, maybe they'll go into uh, the school uh, and stay for a little bit, but not stay very long, right? So we're kind of gradually exposing to the scariest thing, which is being in the building all day. Um, with uh, food, what we do is uh, expose folks to the foods that they're either afraid of or adverse to. Um, so when it comes to ARFID, uh, we often have kids who are averse to a particular food um, and, and in those situations, and this often happens with like eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year olds, I won't eat broccoli. I won't eat carrots. I won't eat this. Um, so we're not going to start with the food that they're most afraid of or most averse to. We're going to start with the foods that are, um, more benign. And then we'll get into even the handling or the being around or the smelling or the holding of, um, or even the playing with of the foods that they're afraid of. And then slowly we will pair the foods that they're afraid of with foods that are uh, very rewarding to them. So their least favorite thing with their favorite thing. Um, so that's an example of uh, exposure uh, prevention. Let's see. Okay, um, family-based treatment is also important to, to talk about. Uh, family-based treatment is a model that we use um, there are lots of uh, programs that use uh, different models like CBT and DBT. Um, and while we utilize a tremendous amount of CBT and DBT, uh, a differentiator is family-based treatment, which is really kind of bringing the parents in, educating them, helping them to help their kids. Um, empowered parents are able to help their kids in a very meaningful way. And when a treatment team is in a child's life, we're not meant to be there forever. So we're gonna be there for a little while, we're gonna do the best work we can, but the greatest gift we can give to a child or a teen is helping their parents to better serve them. And so that means uh, you know, really empowering the parents to have more tools um, since they're the people that are gonna be in this, in this young person's life um, for the rest of their life. So, uh, we also do a lot of different experiential therapies. Um, and, uh, there's a lot of research on sort of mind body work, mindfulness, uh, and, uh, creative arts, dance movement to, um, assist and support in eating disorder treatment since the eating disorder is really, uh, this war between the mind and the body. Um, when uh, parents are dealing with uh, a child or a teen who may be exhibiting some uh, early eating disorder symptoms, we really recommend uh, joining with them and talking to them in a very calm and soothing voice, um, not making accusations, not, lower, uh, not raising blood pressure, but rather asking them what's wrong, asking them what's bothering them getting to the root, uh, we call it getting to the heart of the child because the eating disorder behavior is a symptom of something else that's amiss. So if, if we overly focus on the eating disorder behavior, the child is going to think, or the teen is going to think that we're trying to control them and impose our way on them, as opposed to believing that we really wanna know why they're suffering and help them with that problem in a way that's more constructive than the eating disorder. 
Um, uh, we, we work with parents always to help them to know that they are not the cause of their, their children's mental health symptoms, eating disorder, substance abuse. Um, you know, these are, uh, these are biologically based diseases and uh, they have a treatment uh, trajectory and parents can be the greatest asset in that treatment. So we don't want to alienate parents who are our greatest asset by blaming them. Years ago, uh, you know, if you ever heard about people that would go into eating disorder treatment, therapists would say, oh, it's your mother. Oh, it's your father. You know, uh, that, uh, that whole um, philosophy has been completely debunked. Uh, these are biologically based disorders and uh, parents are assets and tools and not uh, liabilities. Um, so we always work on in improving client and family communication, increasing client and family communication, helping families to communicate more effectively with their teen, helping teens to be able to express themselves emotionally to their parents, not to stuff their feelings, not to grin and bear it, um, and not to be afraid of confrontation. Because sometimes kids are very upset with their peers, their teachers, their parents, but they can't confront them because they don't have either the language or the skills. And so they'll stuff that pain and that resentment and that anger. And that manifestation is depression and, and uh, self-loathing. And so we really need to kind of give kids this emotional language so they know how to um, tell somebody that bothered me, that hurt my feelings. I didn't like that. I don't like it when you do that. And it's safe for them to say that. Um, so, you know, when we're looking at uh, an adolescent who's struggling at dinner, maybe the adolescent made a tiny little plate and you know that they need more, right? So instead of saying that's a tiny little plate, one might say, Hey, are you feeling anxious? <laughs> you know, how are you feeling right now? Ask an open-ended question um, and, and uh, focus more on what's happening under the surface rather than uh, what's happening on their plate. Okay. All right. So, um, so that concludes sort of my, uh, my presentation on um, eating disorders, mental health, uh, and so I'd love to hear if anyone has any questions at all or, or comments, um, because that, that's really my favorite part of this. And I'll, I'll look at the um, Q&A. Or anything I didn't touch on that you, you wished I had. Yes. Um, so I... Uh, so if you remember sort of the history of eating disorders, um, the, uh, the original sort of thought process around eating disorders uh, was kind of a guessing game. And, you know, Richard Morton said, oh, it's a nervous consumption. Uh, somebody else said, oh, it's for uh, religious purification. Somebody else said, uh, well, I think it's... Um, you know, a sexual thing, right? Like they, there, it was just a guessing game. Uh, you know, in the past 50 years, we've actually been able to do uh, incredible research on eating disorders. And um, a lot of that research happens in these treatment facilities, um, even like our own, where we can measure, uh, you know, uh, admission details, um, what's happening during the process, discharge details, what's happening a year later. Um, so what has come of all of this data, which more and more comes out every single day, um, and I, I go to a, a couple of conferences annually and just, you know, fill myself with um, all of the new studies that have been released. Um, what's come of this data is that we've learned uh, increasingly how biologically based eating disorders are. So we're talking about genetics. And we're talking about people who essentially have, uh, you know, a loaded gun of uh, a genetic history that uh, the trigger that ends up getting pulled could be 
their environment, a comment that's made by someone, a trauma that happens in their lives, um, or just their very per the extremism within their personality type, right? That their their perfectionism is just so off the charts that there's it's maladaptive. Um, but uh, when you when you think about eating disorders that way, I think it really helps for families to feel first of all less blamed and stigmatized because. Uh, you know, historically, parents were so shamed for having a child with an eating disorder. And it was almost like, you don't know how to care for your child, or why did you let this happen? Or they must be doing it in reaction to you. Um, now, you know, we, uh, we can, you know, show parents the data, and they can see that uh, their child always had a predisposition for eating disorder, and we can come to understand what the activating events were and what then maintained that eating disorder, right? So what was it that started it and what was it that kept it in place? And whatever it was that kept it in place, that's the piece that we need to move and manipulate through family therapy and counseling, because that's the piece that we actually have control over. Um, I will add to, um, you know, anorexia in particular, for example, is uh, unbelievably associated with low serotonin. Um, so people with low serotonin are very prone to anorexia. Um, what does that mean? Uh, once someone is refed and they're, you know, in their ideal body weight uh, category, so medication will work for them, um, people with anorexia can benefit from an SSRI. Um, and so, uh, so these are the factors that we, we have to look at, um, rather than, uh, you know, like I said, comparing and contrasting two years ago when it was really a lot of blame game without, uh, any metrics behind that. Um, yeah, and, and that's a great question, Alex. The, um, I agree. I think that the biology and the genetics aspect of eating disorders um, is the area where there, there is the most growth and interest right now. Um, I'm going to a conference in a few weeks and I'll be hearing more about that um, from sort of a, a recap of, of this year. But uh, it, it's, it's so endlessly fascinating to me because I also wonder, you know, in the future, and I'm sure that this will be the case at some point, um, if we'll be able to predict uh, who might be at risk or who might be vulnerable. Um, as it is, I, you know, when I meet uh, young kids, you know, and I, I assess sort of their temperament or their personality, you, you can often tell who is at risk for eating disorder based on, you know, some of their, uh, their belief systems or their family history um, or, you know, their perfectionism, their rigidity, their anxiety. Uh, but I think it'll be really interesting to see if we can learn more and then really hone in on prevention work for those individuals, uh, because very similarly to substance use, you know, a lot of people tell their kids, you know, we have a family history here of alcoholism. You really can't safely drink. You need to be aware that we're not the same as, you know, um, so-and-so's family, uh, because we've got six alcoholics in our family. Um, so it is, you know, it's helpful to know. And I agree, uh, Lisa, it does go in, it does go on for generations. It's so true. Um, you know, it's, uh, but the legacy that that legacy can stop here, right? So that's the amazing thing. It's kind of, uh, I always think that we have the power and our kids have the power to, um, with information to do something differently. Um, so uh, for, for family therapy, we, we, you know, we do psychoeducation, but we also do a lot of family communication work, really trying to help kids to practice confrontation, safe confrontation, uh, you know, naming things that bother them, articulating things that uh, are upsetting for them, being able to talk about those things without feeling like they're going to hurt someone's feelings. Uh, a lot of the kids that we treat are uh, very afraid of hurting anyone's feelings, but they will stuff their emotions 
and cause tremendous harm to themselves rather than tell mom or dad that something they did bothered them or tell friend something they did bothered them. So, you know, they need to really learn these sort of expressive skills so that they can uh, safely go to people and talk about how they feel in life. And that may mean um, practicing that work in family therapy um, and telling their parents what helps, what doesn't help. You know, mom and dad, when you do this, it's really helpful. When you do this, it's not so helpful. Um, so, you know, that's, that's also kind of, you know, an opportunity for parents to listen and to learn from the patient. Okay. Um, well, I, 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 I just want to, again, thank you so much for, um, for hosting me and for giving uh, time to this subject. It's uh, a subject that is really important to me. Um, I really believe that there's so much that we all can do to help this next generation to have a better body image and relationship with food uh, than we all have had. And uh, I think that, you know, if, if we can kind of help them uh, so that their children, you know, are, are not carrying some of these generational legacies. Um, it's a beautiful thought. So um, I, I really appreciate uh, you creating the time. And uh, I'm also happy to share this presentation. Um, I, I, you know, created it for people to be able to, um, I, to utilize. And so uh, I can type um, I'll type my email address if I can figure out. And how. I will also be sending out after this, um, the recording, I can send out the slides as well. Oh, um, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, um, I'm not exactly sure how to use the chat, but I'm sending my email address into it. Um, so that if anyone does have, uh, questions that they want to ask that are more personal, um, they can email me and I'll, you know, I can respond that way. And that way, you know, they don't have to, you know, sometimes people don't want to ask questions on a forum. Um, so that's fine. You know, I can, I can reply that way too. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I typed my email address, which is just Mary at, uh, liftupwellness.com long L I F T U P W E L L NESS.com. Um, so I put it in the chat. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Well, I want to thank you so much. I mean, really, so much information that you shared. So I thank you for that. Um, I did want to mention that TPOD has um, their student survey results available, and we're beginning to roll that out. And while we don't ask specifically about eating disorders, we do ask a lot of questions about risk and protect protective factors. Um, we also ask about social media use and how that's affecting kids, the way they feel about themselves, the way they see themselves and others. Um, so I encourage you as that starts rolling out to look for that, because um, I think that that does relate to some of the things that you were talking about earlier um, with you know how social media has affected the way kids are seeing themselves. Um, and again, I thank you so much. I thank everyone for being here tonight. You will receive the slides, the recording. It will also be available on our website. There will be a survey, which I do urge you to please fill out if you have the time. And if you have any questions, Mary shared her email address. You should also have my email address um, and you can reach out and we will hopefully be able to answer any questions you might have. So thank you. So Kirsten, oh, if night. I could just, oh, I could go just ahead. say one thing, I'm sorry. I, I, on behalf of the town, Mary, I just wanna thank you it was a very informative presentation and we had a, a, a really good turnout this evening and I'm hoping those that they couldn't make it um, to have the opportunity to to watch it uh, on our on, on the teapot website and do, um, however else we make it available to people. So thank you again, so incredibly important. All right, All right thank you Sorry, everyone. I was have muted, a I, said, I said my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and uh, I'm I'm so glad that the parents that were here tonight are armed with, you know, some more information, and uh, and then that information can channel out and you know 
Uh, if, if there's someone who is struggling or, or a parent who's dealing with this and they feel like they're alone, you know, a parent who is here tonight might be there to help them out and, and you know, provide some resources. Um, so that, that makes me feel really good. And uh, there's a bunch of resources too. I think at the very end of the um, presentation, I have a whole bunch of websites that people can check out um, for, you know, more information and, uh, you know, even some websites that are helpful for kids and adolescents, you know, who are, who are concerned about themselves. So thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. And Bill, thank you.